Welcome. Welcome. I think we have Welcome. Um, welcome to SBAN's Building Our Own Collective Ownership, Cooperative Real Estate Investment and Community Wealth Building. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your conversations and panels thus far, and I'm super excited to be with you here today uh, and to engage in this conversation. So I'm Stacy Sutton. Uh, Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Policy, and I'm joining you today from the unceded lands of the Ojibwe, Odawada, and Potawatomi Nations, also known as Chicago. So I'm here in Chicago because I'm on faculty at the University of Illinois Chicago, uh, where I focus on economic democracy, solidarity economy, community wealth building, um, Black Cooperative Economics and Gentrification. I'm also proud to be on uh, the kind of leadership team of SBAN. So today's conversation, we are going to focus on some of the things that I know, but more importantly, a lot of things that I'm still learning and our panelists will really, um, it's their areas of expertise. So I think you're in for a real treat. Um, and like many of you, you know, I've been studying and, and, and working in community economic development and, and thinking about community economic development models for, for a couple of decades now, quite honestly. Um, and I've been particularly motivated by the grassroots, community-led, cooperative, or collective action initiatives that I've been seeing across the country especially those that aim to preserve black and, and, and brown neighborhoods, um, the, the initiatives that really catalyze community agency and enable kind of community wealth building. So that I think is the, the center of what we will be discussing today. Um, and this is, I think, a, a kind of a, a timely conversation in that over the last few years, over the last decade, but surely over the last few years, there's been kind of a notable expansion in these cooperative enterprises, both cooperative businesses, but also the broader ecosystem that enables them, yeah? Um, and there's also greater public awareness of non-traditional, what I will call non-traditional approaches to community economic development, um, access, to non-extractive capital, um, a, a more kind of, I think, greater familiarity with community decision-making and democratic investment. And also there is more kind of latitude and understanding of the role of the city, the role that cities, municipalities can play in enabling these environments. So today's panel, and the reason I'm so thrilled is that we'll be able to kind of touch on each of those areas. Um, today's panel comes from a, a kind of a broad swath of perspectives from, and, and geographies from Boston to LA, um, doing grassroots kind of organizing, but also in city government. Some do research, some are actually on the ground doing practice. So we're also looking both nationally and locally. So we have multiple scales that we're engaging today. So I would like to introduce, I'll just name the four, four panelists and then allow each of them to do their introduction. So first we have Nia Evans, who is here joining us from Boston, the Boston Ojima Project. Uh, Damien Goodman from Liberty, Liberty Community CLT and downtown Crenshaw. Sagoon Idawu, I, I, I I'm sorry, Idawu. I'm sorry that I pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, the city of Chicago, uh, city of Chicago, city, and gave you the wrong city, uh, the city of Boston, where he's the chief of, um, in the office of, of economic opportunity and inclusion. And we have Brett Theodos, who's at the Urban Institute in DC and um, uh, it, within the community economic development area. So let's just start with Nia and you can just kind of describe your work, maybe take a, a, a minute, you know, two minutes to introduce yourself. Great, thank you, Stacy, and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. Can you all hear me? Sorry, 
my mic was up. Uh, uh, thank you, Stacy. So thank you for this uh, invitation to participate in this panel. It's always great to be in conversation with you. Uh, and uh, I've had the opportunity to also be in conversation with Brett, Damien, and Shigun, all at different points in time. So I'm excited that we're all here together. Uh, my name is Nia Evans. I use she, her pronouns. I'm with Boston Ujima Project. I'm our executive director, and I'll keep it super brief uh, because I don't I don't know how to be brief, so I'll just keep it very, very short. And I'll just say Ujima is short for Swahili. Uh, we are a Black-led, uh, cooperatively run arts, finance, and investment ecosystem. Uh, and what that means is uh, we've, we've created an ecosystem comprised of a capital fund, a capital loan fund, a business alliance, uh, anchor institution strategy, and a membership body uh, to democratic to democratically decide what it is that we will invest in uh, in our communities. And I'll just keep it at that for now. Thank you. Um, uh, Damien. Good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to be here at the inaugural S-Band conference. Um, uh, my name is Damien Goodman. I'm here in unceded Tongawen, otherwise known as Los Angeles, uh, based in the South Central Los Angeles community of Crenshaw. Um, I think the effort that has really gotten us a, a lot of attention is the downtown Crenshaw project, an effort to really buy the largest commercial asset in Black Los Angeles, 40 acres, um, that was slated to be a mega gentrification project, 3 million square feet in the middle of a Black community, with the ma majority of the housing being market rate. Um, 27 years to the day uh, that uh, started the uprising uh, regarding the, the acquittal uh, and the beating of Rodney King, um, it was announced that uh, a developer wanted to buy that project and expand it. And it's not a good developer. And we as a community said that we'd come together and, and seek to buy it ourselves. Um, it was audacious to say that, you know, a $100 million, 40 acre project could be under community control. And the response that we got, the ground squirrel from the community, the ground squirrel that we got from, um, you know, philanthropy and social impact investors from throughout the country was telling and then telling in the, in the respect that we've got to dream big and do big. At the end of the day, we, we submitted an offer for $122 million that included $35 million in philanthropy, over $34 million in social impact investing, a debt equity partner or a debt partner to cover the rest. Um, and they still didn't sell it to us. But this work that we began yet, I'll say yet, we're going to get our mall, uh, hashtag 40 acres and a mall. The work that we have been engaging in since and prior is to build this ecosystem, this liberty ecosystem that is based on this belief that Black people have a right to self-determination and to control the destiny and the future in this space they occupy. Um, so just in the past five months, we've utilized some of those resources towards taking commercial property in our Africa town, the Lumber Park Village, which is the center of culture, commerce, and community for Black Los Angeles off the speculative market, both protecting uh, tenants from displacement, but also building this solidarity economy. It is so great to be here with this August panel. Um, some of my favorite people are here and I'm just looking forward to this conversation so very much. Thank you, Damien. Um, uh, next, let's go to Sagoon. Well, thank you, Stacy, And um, uh, it's fine about uh, you know, saying another city, if, if Chicago ever wants me, you know, if you reach out in the next 10 years, I'm happy to pay a visit. Um, but uh, my name is uh, Shagan. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I um, want to start off by thanking uh, Nia Evans. Uh, uh, I'll say publicly one of my closest friends um, uh, because uh, I would not be on this panel if she did not recommend it and would instead be in the audience. But um, either way, I'm looking forward to all that I have to learn from the experts who were on this panel um, and those who were attending this conference. Um, I'm here because uh, I am uh, have the privilege for the last 10 months and seven days to serve as the Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion for the City of Boston um, alongside Mayor Michelle Wu. And, uh, you know, if I were here a year ago, I would have said we are the Office of Economic Development. Uh, and we changed our name uh, beginning in January because what was what is understood on the ground on the streets of Boston and really throughout the entire country, as has already been shared, um, is that when people think of the term and see in practice economic development, uh, they think about uh, the very real conversations around gentrification and displacement. 
Um, many Bostonians see the cranes in the skies and they see rents uh, as high as those cranes. And so what was important to me and the mayor was that before they meet me or members of our team, that they understand the work that we're doing and who we do it for. And so while our goal is to continue to create you know, opportunities to foster these new opportunities. What undergirds all of our work is racial equity um, and ensuring that all are uh, at the table uh, at the beginning of conversations as opposed to being tacked on at the end just to score some points. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to be here uh, to talk about some of the work that we've been doing uh, to keep people where they are while at the same time enhancing uh, uh, and beautifying our neighborhoods. Um, and it's why our vision today is of a city that is more vibrant and sustainable, um, one that centers people um, and uh, one that creates opportunities to build generational wealth. And I'm happy to be here with so many others uh, who share that same vision. All right, thank you, Sagoon. Um, next, hopefully you can still hear me, just let folks know my kind of technology is going in and out, but um, let's hear from Brett. Hi, everyone. So good to be with you. Uh, yes, excited to share and learn today. My name is Brett Theodos. I'm at the Urban Institute. We're a nonprofit research group. We're based in DC. So I think in some ways I'm the official fly on the wall here. I've had the privilege of documenting some of the emerging models that are going on around the country, the bubbling up efforts that we're seeing and talking to uh, early strategy design outcomes and other uh, intended benefits. So I'm excited to be with you. Okay, so again, uh, this is a little awkward because I can't hear everything. So if it sounds like I'm repeating myself, I'm not being rude. I really just, um, the technology is going in and out. Uh, but thank you for those introductions. Uh, I guess one question I have, the fact that we're here together and that you know many of you know each other and you've been in dialogue before, it suggests to me that there is something different at this moment, right? That we've been in this work for some time um, and there is something happening within this field of community economic development and these collective ownership models that may be different than, than historically. I mean, we don't need to go into the full history, but we know that there have been peaks and troughs in terms of uh, collective ownership models. But, um, but, but just what you represent in the cities and municipalities that you represent suggests that there's something something is different and I, I don't want to give away what I my hypothesis but maybe you can speak to that if you if you're just wondering if you have a sense of of the moment that we're in now does anybody want to short speak to that I'll go for it I'll I'll, I'll start us off okay. um and hopefully hopefully a couple a couple of us will answer this so I'll, I'll also try to be brief as well um, so what is the moment? Um, I guess that, I guess there are two primary things that I am, um, uh, thinking of. Um, so we are for one, uh, in, in the middle of a pandemic. However, uh, the efforts, uh, that, that we're all involved with definitely, um, predate, predate the pandemic. But, um, I use the pandemic, uh, as a, a pretty clear example of um, showcasing uh, the failures and, and the weaknesses of um, many conventions. Um, so the, fail the failures and the weaknesses of, of, of many systems and, and many conventions in terms of, and I appreciate that you, you talked about peaks and, and troughs and to really pointing to an, an earlier history to these movements um, and, and understanding we're not, we're not talking about anything that's, co that's completely new. Um, but what I, what I would say the the real kind of clear, undeniable failures that we're experiencing, um, I think have, uh, number one, uh, given us permission for lack of a better word, uh, permission is not the right word. I would say the, the, the failures that we, that we're experiencing, um, have prompted then, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, motivation to just to just do something do 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 something different. Mm -hmm. um, and for some of us, that's new. Uh, uh, for some of us, it's um, bringing back 
uh, something that that we we knew before. So I think that that's one thing in terms of the moment um, is we're we're saying, well, we've been trying A, B, C, D, E, F, G, because this is what we've been taught for however long, and it's it's not working. That it's undeniable. So we might as well, <laughs> we might as well try some other things. And then I think the corollary to that, in terms of the moment, and when I'm thinking particularly of BIPOC communities, I think particularly of of Black communities. Again, um, referencing the fact that a lot of things that we are doing are not completely new. Um, that they that they are historical. That they have been a part um, of of our cultures. Uh, that they have been a part of our ways of being. Um, and uh, in the past, they had been suppressed. Um, they had been terrorized out of us. And so I think the other thing happening in, in this moment um, is a certain type of not being so afraid anymore um, and declaring uh, our own value um, and rejecting a value of our, com of our communities um, that is... Uh, you know that is that is that is inaccurate and that and that's based on faulty premises, and so our communities are are saying for ourselves, um, this this is what we see in our communities. This is what we think our communities are are worth. And so then uh, there are certain things that we are reaching back to, acknowledging as valuable. And uh, again, we're also uh, in this um, frame where we're also looking to create a new. So I think that's what I would say about the moment. Thank you. That was that was perfect. Anybody else want to kind of share their understanding of the moment? Well, um, it's awkward for me to speak on behalf of government because a year ago I was suing government. Um, but uh, what I will say, representing <laughs> a governmental administration on the local level, um, is is at least. Um, what's happening in this moment. Um, I think the pandemic is actually, um, at least on the government side, something that has deeply impacted the way in Boston that we're working or how we're addressing issues. In fact, I mean, I ask my team this, uh, these three questions all the time, but across the administration, these questions get asked uh, whenever we're hit with an issue, uh, you know, and talk about solutions, the three questions we ask are, um, is it a law, is it a policy, or is it just the way we've always done things? And more often than not, what COVID showed us is that most things fall in that latter category of this is just the way we've always done things. Um, and, it, and that has allowed us to um, take a look at, um, you know, the way we've been doing things and changing them up and then codifying the practices and policies that are going to support uh, the communities that we want to impact. But then, of course, you know, two years ago, we all saw on our screens, whether it was a TV or phone, a laptop, uh, the a lynching uh, of George Floyd. And um, that has also uh, had a huge impact because now, um, at least you, know, you might have heard in my intro, you know, this conversation around equity. Um, we're very intentional, though, in the administration of talking about racial equity, because the reason we're talking about equity is what happened two years ago, um, uh, where the whole nation uh, began having this conversation. So um, I would just say the moment we're in is, um, I hope it doesn't remain a moment, that's the first piece, um, but that at least it has allowed local government here in Boston to reevaluate the way that we're doing things, um, and then to put a framework in place of, you know, making sure that anything that we produce is going to help us reach our ultimate vision uh, that I shared earlier. So. It's an important moment for the city and one I hope continues for many generations. And I'll just add, I mean, I, I think both. Okay, so I heard much of that, <laughs> but not all of it. Uh, I will, I'll just add, Amy, you want to go? Dr. Sutton, that, you know, one, I, I love um, Nia's reference to Sankofa as bringing from that past and taking what is useful to, to move forward. And only add that I think if we're talking about from a black perspective, even just a human perspective, this individualized capitalistic framework, which we were taught is foreign to us, um, especially as black people who operate in black community. Um, we've had to operate behind, frankly, enemy lies and in a racialized capitalistic system where we look to one another to meet the needs that aren't being met by private sector, by the nonprofit sector, by the government sector. 
And so in the in the wake of, and this is what I can see us experiencing, especially in, in Los Angeles and absolutely in Boston and Chicago as well, in the wake of what I like to call the great white return, this mass displacement crisis that is putting our communities in peril, our commercial communities, our residential communities, our communities as a whole, we're going back and realizing the necessity of us banding together. Um, the roots for uh, downtown Crenshaw in this this cooperative in this community wealth building literally go back to the uprisings of 1992 in an organization called Hope Hyde Park Organizational Partnership for Empowerment, where we were talking about um, building cooperative economics and collective ownership um, in the wake of the in the wake of when all those resources came to Los Angeles after the King uprising. Um, and we tried that other stuff. It hasn't worked. We're tired of just being, in so many respects, as residents, as community stakeholders, the community collaborators who are just supposed to be uh, the, the, the front in so many respects, the public relations, the engagement officers, but not really having tr true, true control in the direction of our progress pr projects in a, on a good day. And on a bad day, we're just completely ignored. We're ignored by government, we're ignored by the, the private sector. So yes, now's the time to be bold. Um, the, the awareness that comes from the black white wealth gap conversation needs to, in, in, the, in the, the rightfully stated, the lynching of George Floyd on our television screens, on our uh, phones have led to this awareness and this conversation today. And I think we're really just, again, pulling back from what is naturally ours, what has worked in the past in saying, this is a much better framework going forward, especially since in the context of climate catastrophe, it's going to get worse. Just one extra thought to add, agree with everything that's said. Uh, and so I don't repeat that. The one thing that I'll say that has also changed is technology. Mm -hmm. We can aggregate small investors in a way that we couldn't do previously. So there probably always was a desire to do some of these things. Um, clearly, there's more attention to community ownership and community participation, community design. Um, but we can also do it more now, easier than we could even a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that I think that's, that's that's good and that's bad <laughs> from a <laughs> standpoint. People are buying property in my backyard from their pajamas in another part of the country. Right. That yeah, is the leading. So it, it, and, and in so many respects, like I can definitely say in the context of an ecosystem, it's us taking an analysis, taking an examination of these other tools to figure out how we can get those tools that are being used and were created and are harming our community and actually use them ourselves for the creation of stabilization and the growth of our communities. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it's extremely important. And I you know, I imagine a lot of folks have tuned in because they want to hear about the models on the ground that are working um, and how you've been able to and you know move forward, how you've been able to cultivate this momentum and and make some changes in your areas. Yeah. Um, and I think technology is a part of it, uh, with, which has both the upsides and downsides to it. But I think I want to start the, a conversation around the role of the local state, right? Because we're all operating within the, the state. We're all operating within the city. So, um, you know, we, we've had progressive cities before. This is, you know, people have been writing about progressive cities for decades, but this whole investment in community wealth building that's happening at the city or the city and uh, aligning and, and partnership with uh, kind of grassroots groups. Can you want to speak to that, Sigmund? Sure. Or, or anyone, or a grassroots group in terms of how you've engaged with the city and what the strengths and limits of that engagement might be. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, I, was, I don't know how long we had to talk about the limits, but uh, you know, I'll just say, you know, I am uh, very lucky uh, to uh, have grown up in Boston at a time that we're in. Uh, at the moment, um, you know, the organization I led before this, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, was focused on supporting Black businesses across the state. And um, prior to that, was doing some work with the NAACP, which is where I met Madam Evans here. And um, shortly after NAACP is when she uh, started the, the Boston Ujima Project. And 
just the learning from that experience has shaped the work that I'm doing at the city now. Um, and, and I mentioned BECMA because there were a lot of things that we did together when I was there, and now we're bringing that here to the city. So anyway, this, this question about the role of the city, you know, like I said, uh, for all of my life, except for the last year, I have been outside of government and um, have always seen the role of the city as kind of what you what you shared that, you know, not just talking about being progressive, but putting your money where your mouth is. And so a number of different initiatives that we have launched to support, um, uh, you know, businesses across the city and uh, black and brown communities. But the one that um, I'm proudest of so far, because it's only been one year, and I, we're going to do many more in the next, you know, several years, um, is our commercial acquisition program. Because as much as we talk about um, anti-displacement, no grant is going to prevent a business from being kicked out of its uh, uh, location or um, whole blocks from being bought up and, and, and folks having to be pushed out. Um, and so uh, this was a program developed not just in conjunction, you know, with, with feedback and, and input from uh, Nia and Brett who are on this call and many others in the community, um, but even it came from conversations we've had with small business owners. I mean, we, since I joined uh, in February, every week we go out for these weekly business walks to hear from people what are, what are the types of things you want to see from the city? And what has always come up every single time is I would love to buy my building. And so what we are, so what this program is going to allow us to do where millions are being invested by the city. And then we're going to be, uh, we, we have a meeting with um, uh, banks and CDFIs and other lending partners over the next uh, couple of months to make sure it's not just us that's, that's helping, you know, our residents out, but all of the neighbors and all the corporate neighbors here. Um, it, it's three different parts and I'm gonna wrap it up because I know time, I'm also not good at being brief, um, but there are three parts. The first part is our uh, development agency um, will, you know, it, in, in areas at risk of gentrification, uh, we, you know, if, if someone is, or a, some group of businesses are under threat of a building being sold right from under them, um, our city can step in and just acquire the building outright. Um, and that will, you know, it can either be that we just acquire it, hold it, give affordable rents and keep people where they are, or we set up an agreement to uh, transfer uh, ownership of the property to those in uh, that property. Um, so then they become the property owners. And then the third piece is a, an actual direct loan um, to a business or group of businesses to acquire the property that they're in. One quick example that I'll just say is there's a building in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Boston called the Bertullo Building, a historic uh, building. Um, and the, the owners at the time were gonna, no first right of refusal, they were just gonna sell it to whoever was the highest bidder. And you know, uh, a number of community partners stepped in. And when I joined this office in January, um, immediately working with our housing team, you know, uh, transferred a million dollars uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that number. Anyway, we 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 supported the project, um, and uh, now you know five black businesses, affordable housing up top, own the building, um, and you know I what we weren't able to do was to create an actual cooperative of the businesses um, to, to help stabilize them in that way. But it was an important learning moment because now built into the program that we're putting together is um, prioritizing getting folks to form cooperatives. Um, if there's going to be city money involved. And then the, the work of the Ujima project is going to help us also democratize the process. Um, so that's what we're working through right now to make sure that everyone is playing a role in how these dollars are spent. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Can, uh, I, yeah, can sure. I add something to that, Stacey? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think the thing I wanted to just, and, I, and hopefully this is also answering your, your question about the, the role of the, the local state, the role of the city, a um, couple of principles I, that I think are important to pull out there. Um, Damien earlier just kind of talked about generally um, how residents um, and even how grassroots orgs are kind of treated in these in these processes. So, uh, you know, as Damien, as Damien said, we're, we're the engagement, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the engagement team. We're the we're the PR. Uh, Shigan alluded to it. We're the last we're the last checkbox uh, before you, you you can get through. And so one of the things that I think is important to point out about our relationship, it's kind of like um, technology where it, depending on how it's, how it's used, it, it could be positive, it could be negative. On the one hand, it could be cronyism. Um, however, on the other hand, uh, in terms of, of, of relationships, just really pull, pull out the importance 
of uh, genuine co-equal partnership and relationship between uh, governments and uh, residents and grassroots orgs and, and other stakeholders. So I think that that's a, a, a piece um, in terms of the example that Shigun just gave um, that's really important. And that also just makes me think about the, the nature of uh, representation in a way that's not shallow. Uh, so Shigun talked about um, his experience growing up in Boston. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a difference between uh, someone with a, with a background um, of Shigun, for example, now acting uh, as a partner and a representative in government, as opposed to someone else uh, with a with with a, with a different lived experience. So also, just just kind of raising that because I think sometimes too in our conversations, in in a bunch of different conversations, sometimes there's kind of like a bifurcation between uh, you know electoral service or government and 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 other types of service. Uh, where I would I would think ideally uh, we would we it really would be we the people we are government and Damien talked about this as well when we're talking we're, we're talking about community control um, I would I would think we're we are seeing that these uh, elements are, are are present and then the last thing I want to say is uh, the other thing I think this is important um, and correct me if I'm wrong again but when I think about this commercial acquisition program the details are really important so again when I when I go back to thinking about relationships. And and who uh, is is representing us in in, in government? Um, that that goes to uh, some of the really small details that that are important. That you know, I think creates a difference between uh, programs that work and don't work. So, for example, one of the things we talked about with this program was being sure not to unwittingly create barriers uh, for businesses who could participate in this program. Uh, we, we see it on the investing side, for example, so not kind of creating certain types of requirements when it comes to track records, for example, that would that would make certain businesses not eligible. So I think, you know, pro, the, the program design is definitely very hev heavily dependent on how our um, how our different organizations are working together. Yeah, that, that's extremely <laughs> important. And we don't have enough time and we really want to go into the detail of that. Right. I think a lot of folks on the call on, on, in the um viewing would really want to understand how that's structured. So we're going to just kind of put that in the parking lot, as they say, because I think there, as, as Nia mentioned, the proof is in the detail. Um, but for those, I mean, some of the questions that are coming up have to do with folks that are just entering this work, right? We all began somewhere and super intrigued by what's possible, but you know, are curious about the ecosystems in the various locations that have to be in place at the early stages to start developing some of what we see in Boston, some of what we see in, in LA, some of what we see in a lot of cities. So maybe I'll start this time with Brett because you have a kind of a national scope in terms of your research um, and what are some of the essential elements for those that are really trying to do both cooperative economics on the ground, anti-displacement work? What are some of the essential elements you would offer? And maybe point to a couple of places that you think are emblematic. Love, love the question and so important. I, the fundamental starting place is leadership. And so the people you see on this meeting are emblematic of what it takes. We need charismatic, sold out leaders who are going to see things through a long time and a long way and can hustle up funding and zoning variances and loans and investments and do community engagement. Like there are so many hats on like Damien, he actually has six hats under that hat. <laughs> like, so it's hard to set. So, okay. Uh, so uh, there is not yet a build a community wealth building investment platform in a box kit. And in some sense, we never want it to be 100% that because we want it to be tailored to local context. But on the other hand, if everybody every time has to reinvent every technology system, every financial education, let me tell you what this thing is, 
tool, every outreach material, every financial platform, every uh, loan guarantee requirement, every legal document, every, 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 um, then this will be a bespoke thing. And it'll be super cool and there'll be news articles about it, but it will be limited in reach. Those will be really neat trophies that we can point to collectively and say, woohoo, we can look at this, like things are nice. Um, but it won't be the lived experience for most neighborhoods and most people. And so it, it, it's not a criticism, that's just where we're at in our trajectory. We're, we're incubating, we're innovating, and that's super exciting. Uh, as somebody who gets to look across the country and see those different dynamics. And from there, eventually, not too soon, but we're going to need towards scaling. We're going to need the Ujima project to be the Ujima project, not the Boston Ujima project, right? I'm not putting pressure on you, kids. Uh, or, or any of the other groups, right? Um, we see the Guild in Atlanta, the Community Investment Trust, right? There are all these different models. There's a lot of cooperative models. Um, and so we're going to need those platforms. And, and there's tensions there because you want something to be grassroots and embedded and with community priorities. On the other hand, um, it takes a lot of money and time to set these up. And if every single one of them is completely unique, um, we're, we're going to be at this longer than we have time for. Like communities can't actually wait uh, for that long of a process. So. Uh, so that's what I see. Uh, excitement, innovation. Every day I feel like my newsfeed, not every day, every month my newsfeed is filled with a different example, some of which are very much in the design phase, but some of them are, are, are really moving forward. And so uh, there is momentum and we need the infrastructure increasingly built out institutionally. Some of that can be a referral network, some of that can be open source, doesn't all have to be uh, fully uh, the same, but some of it might be. Maybe we are there. We have some shared service provided. I, I appreciate that response, particularly because I have this adverse response typically to um, scale, a conversation around scale. But you put scale at the design phase. You put scale at the infrastructure, right? It's not just the outcomes that we need scaled. So, and, and I think that's important to hold. Um, maybe Damien, you can share how, I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're on the ground. So it's the, it's the work that you're doing on the ground and what you see, what, what's needed. Well, I call myself a firefighter <laughs> because I'm on call all day, every day. Uh, what Brett mentioned regarding um, having those uh, who are community based rooted in the community that are able to you know, go to a community meeting in the evening and talk to a bank in the morning and him up the elected official in the afternoon. Um, and I think we're, we do have that. That was one of the things that we found um, as we were looking toward how we're going to buy this Crenshaw Mall. How are we going to be able to build out this ecosystem? Literally, the people were already in the community. People knew and had expertise on community land trust, fund formation, um, small business development, cooperative formation all of these things and you just had to bring it together. Um, I think, you know, from our perspective and we were so um, inspired uh, in the early days of the ecosystem by the work that's being done at Uchima and other models that we knew we would have to have scale for the purpose of impact, um, being in a hot real estate market where, um, you know, the, the cost of everything, uh, the, every piece of property has gone up dramatically. And so we started from a standpoint, understanding there was going to be naturally this contradiction. And that's the contradiction between the requirements of capital and our desires to be community-based. The desire to move slowly, go, go far together as opposed to quickly alone, um, given that we're literally dealing with people who have ungodly sums of money and are coming in to take everything. Um, and so it's been an interesting you know, process where we, we've created different entities and different structures that allow us to adapt. So there is the, the what we're building out, the impact fund, which is 
more toward those non-extractive and community-friendly capital partners, and we'll eventually get to a point of seeing if these foundations are real about their commitments. And at the same time, we're talking the policy dialogue at the cities. I mean, our city, I'm not going to get it how ridiculous our police budget was. If we got just a little bit of a fraction of that, we could completely protect it. But even on a policy level, right, simply saying we recognize this is a historic BIPOC community. We recognize all of these tools and all this money exists to get rid of it. We're going to just put up a, a little box around it. You can't play the same way here that you do everywhere else or that it is giving commercial uh, or, or residential tenants an opportunity to purchase it, and then drawing down the balance sheets of foundations, DAS, and the city coming in, and putting together that often creative and complicated capital stack to get to the end goal, right? There's a significant role that policy simply that, that, that uh, can play in creating the playing field that allows us to create that little ingenuity. And then on the basic level, making sure that communities understand, individuals understand their, their individual commitments. So you shouldn't have to be an accredited investor to be in to be involved in the purchase of a property, to be involved in the seeding of a business. Um, and so there's that's where the community investment fund comes up, comes up. But these are all things that are frankly taking place. Again, I can't underscore it, at least in the context of Los Angeles. And I know in so many communities and in, in urban hot coastal areas in, 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 in the context of rapid speculation. Um, and so. How can we, and this is where our roots as an ecosystem come from policy, come from advocacy, come from organizing, how can we change the framework? How can we change the, the context in which these great creative ideas, these great creative structures can be implemented? Um, and that's, you know, getting in the street, same way people did two years ago, same way folks have been doing in our community for generations. Yeah, no, that's really important. Um, and, and I guess a question, a broad question, and the question that I see in the chat is essentially um, how, how we make this less idiosyncratic and, and, and as, as Brett said, less bespoke, right? So that it's not this, but, as, but I think that what the question is really getting at, if I could find it again, um, is a way of um, how we are kind of, the tools that we're developing that can be leveraged and transferred, right? So if somebody that's just getting into this work, where do they turn? Well, what's the the resource, the set of resources that are out there? Um, is that we is it that we just call Nia and say, hey, can we just <laughs> do what you're doing? I mean, what do you say to people that are just starting this work? Yeah, um, unfortunately, do not call me. Um, <laughs> I, I used to say, email me, call me. I can't, I can't say that uh, anymore. And Shigun just, just got a look on his face because he, he knows what happens to emails in my inbox. Um, they, they go there to die. But um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what, what, what Brett has says, has said, and, and, um, and I'm thinking about the Brett is, is saying he's kind of getting new, um, new models coming to his, his inbox. Um, uh, every month, and I'm sitting here thinking because I'm, I'm like you, Stacy. Uh, when we when we get asked about scale, um, and, and when we get asked about, and not just Ujima, but this is even in other work that I've that I've done and and ed, ed, ed policy work, and get asked about models replication, I'm kind of like, eh. Um, and and so some of some of the ways that I have thought about scale um, is some of the different models that we see emerging. So that that is one of the way that I've thought of scale. Um, so there, there is one way that Ujima talks about scale, for example, in terms of our, our fund. Right now we have a $5 million fund. We're thinking about what our next fund is, is going to look like. That's going to be a larger fund. We're saying that's going to be a $25 million fund. And so there's scale in, in that sense uh, vertically. But again, I've, I've for a while have been thinking about what scale looks like laterally. And that said, I, I also respect Brett's point that everything can't be its own, uh, you know, unique mm -hmm. um, thing. Um, so I'm starting off with kind of all these models that are going into Brett's inbox, because I want to say, I think there are actually a lot of places right now that people can turn to, which I think is fantastic. So people can turn to Ujima, and there's a way that we've managed the kind of phone calls and the, and the emails. Uh, so for example, one of the things we've done is we created a translocal membership program. So there isn't like a the Ujima project, 
Uh, but uh, the, the the way we look at it is we're we're uh, working pretty intimately with other communities through this translocal membership program to create an ecosystem where they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, Kensington Corridor Trust uh, just became our second translocal member. And the, our first one was Bronx Cooperative Development uh, Initiative. And so then in naming those two, the, those are two uh, uh, additional um, uh, actors that people can look at. There's Downtown Crenshaw, uh, there's Seed Commons. And, and I think one of the things we want to say is we, we learned a lot from Seed Commons. So th- even this kind of piece of Brett kind of talked about, you know, maybe some things are referred out or maybe there are some pieces that some of us can borrow from each other. I do think we're we're at a point right now where we are, we, we do see a little bit of that. That, that. that definitely was Ujima's case. A lot of what we learned about non-extractive finance, we learned from, uh, we learned from Seed Commons. Um, I, I'm not, I haven't actually had a very specific conversation with them about how long it took them from kind of ideation to launch. But I do want to think maybe ours was a little faster. I mean, they started way earlier. So I, I do maybe think that ours was a little faster. And I remember talking to Damien and I feel like downtown Crenshaw got off the ground fast. Um, and cause I know that our fund was, was delayed a year out from when, from when we wanted to do it. Um, so I think that's one thing that I'm really excited about that, uh, there's, there's East Bay permanent real estate cooperative, that there are these different models, um, around the, around the country that people can look at. Um, and then I would say, I think the, what to me, one of the most important things is that our communities understand, and this makes me think of something that Damien said earlier, just in terms of kind of our, um, socialization. Um, that we can do this. I, for me, that's been one of the the biggest roadblocks is our sense of what's possible and our sense of, of what avenues we should be trying out. And I think that the, the different types of models that we've seen uh, and the different types of experiments that we've seen um, are inspiring people to look around their communities and say, hey, what do I want to try here? And I think the fact that, that people are asking that in their communities, that's going to lead us uh, to, to the more kind of um, scale that's less idiosyncratic uh, that, that you and Brett are talking about. Or that's, that'll be one of the first steps, I think. Yeah. No, I think that's extremely important as well in the sense that, but my, my, my concern is that there, you know, we're in conversation and we know a lot of these models and there are a lot of folks that are doing more conventional community economic development and the collective ownership, the thinking about, you know, what kind of capital stack you, you would need to put together to collectively own, an, um, a, you know, real estate, for instance, um, or just cooperative enterprises and own conversions. All of this, this kind of terminology is very foreign to, to the conventional community economic development. So perhaps it is our responsibility to figure out how we get this out there and normalize it more, right? I think I think Next City and um, uh, what's his name, Oscar Oscar Perry, he's doing a good job. <laughs> he's helping. I think um, Urban Institute is doing a good job. They have a lot of publications, um, but people have to know to turn to there to those um, those those resources. Well, and and I would just say, you know, part of that responsibility is also, I guess, back to the you know question you asked right at the top about the role of local government i mean you know one of the things that our small business team is about to launch uh next year is an educational not just a series but having resources available that we're sharing with businesses about what are cooperative you know like like what are they and what you know should your business consider and etc cetera, etc cetera. um and introducing not only the community to the principles but our own team uh and and you know colleagues in city government who also are not as familiar uh, with what we're talking about today. So um, certainly there there is some onus on us to make sure um, that, you know, the folks who are in local, at least here in Boston, in, in government here are, you know, continue to say, um, you know, talk about the new normal, right? Well, that means that we can't be doing things the way we've been doing. And if we're going to lean into that, um, we need to educate ourselves uh, and others on it. And so that's why, again, we're, we're happy that Ujima is a, a partner, but there are others that are helping us uh, lean further into this as well. And on that, I mean, I, with government, um, I was surprised. We had an opportunity to speak at the um, International Cooperative Association's convening in Seoul uh, that was last year. And obviously, Mondragon is the cooperative model for the for the world. They literally have a, a minister, the equivalent of one of our secretaries, who's focused on cooperative development, right? Let's start with that when we start talking about socialization. Who is our minister? Or who is our secretary for the solidarity economy? Um, and if it's not going to happen at the federal level, but it should, 
at the state level, at the county level, at the city level. I mean, getting these things ingrained within the fabric of Absolutely. government is a, is a tremendous method to <laughs> accelerating our growth um, in general. Yeah, no, that's that's right. Um, so we only have uh, maybe a 10 minutes or so. Um, maybe we can go just around one more time and offer some kind of final comments. There are a number of questions in the chat and one that we perhaps didn't address at all has to do with um, how we, how you've leveraged kind of the local cultural economy um, to do this work and how that's come to play. So that's a possible uh, provocative question that you might want to address, but if there's some final comments, um, I think people want the, to really understand the technical, they want to understand the institutional infrastructures. And I just think that might be a lot for this conversation, but we, we should perhaps put some resources together for folks. But, but what else might you offer in terms of how you leverage what's very local um, in a way that is now allowing you to create something that is both sustainable and it's building that momentum, right? Once you see you can, more people will join on and realize, oh, this is possible. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the local culture, local cultural economy. Does anybody want to speak to that? I'm going to do more last thoughts. If that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I try just because again, because I, I know I won't be able to be brief and 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 <laughs> less than ten minutes now. Um, but but I, I do want to talk about what we can offer because um, I I also appreciate again um, you uh, Stacy being attentive to yeah how do we how do we normalize this um, because uh, we're 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 attentive to that uh, as well. So I do want to actually just talk about how we do do that. Um, someone as I said, uh, don't call me, but I will say. <laughs> You, you can email me, but no, it's it's going to take a while for me to, to email you back. Um, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I can talk about the structures that we have set up um, uh, in, 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 in service of um, seeing, seeing this work proliferate. So I talked about our translocal membership. Um, we are, we are focusing, our translocal, focusing our translocal membership program on Black communities who want to create uh, economic democracy ecosystem where they are. Um, so if that's something you would like to chat with me about, I would say email me again, it's, it's going to take some time. You, you, you will hear back. I will be very excited to hear that you want to start something where you are, as I will respond. Uh, the other, the other structure or program that we've, we've created is our quarterly office hours. And it's, and it's with the intent of doing exactly, uh, what, what you would, uh, some of what you would like to happen here. And, and this was to, uh, respond to a lot of the questions, uh, that we were getting from different people in different communities and, and a lot of the requests that we were getting. And so the best way we could find to kind of accommodate that was to cr essentially create a centralized space where it, instead of we were uh, trying to manage how to respond outwards, we're just bringing everyone to the same space at the same time to then answer questions at that time. So that's something we're going to do quarterly. We had our first quarterly office hours in October, and it's it's for exactly that. It's for exactly, hey, uh, I really want to dig, I really want to get into the weeds of how you how you set up your fund. I want to I want to talk about how you leverage your cultural economy. And the and the idea is that it's um, not repetitive. We're taking in questions from uh, participants ahead of time so that we can really address what people's questions are. So those are two things I could definitely say we have on offer in terms of disseminating our learnings, disseminating knowledge, and again, helping this to proliferate. Uh, we do political and financial education workshops every Wednesday, and they're recorded, and then are, they're on our YouTube channel. Uh, so we have people who've, who've been able to access videos on our YouTube channel about cooperative economics, uh, about cooperative structures properly, about collective uh, ownership. So uh, th th there, there's that um, resource there as well. So definitely urge you to check check out our YouTube channel, uh, get on our list so you can learn about the quarterly office hours because that's where you can ask us some questions. And then um, if you want more intimate engagement um, and, you, and you're really trying to do it, you're, it's more than you're curious, you're really trying to do it, check out our translocal membership program. And then I do just want to give a quick um, just shout out just to just say arts and cultural organizing is a really important uh, feature of our work. So I, I appreciate the question about cultural economy, but I just I just know I'm not going to be able to answer it concisely. Fair 
David, you want to take that on? I mean, not take on the final comments. Well, I mean, I think in general for anyone who wants to do it, or the the first word is just do it. <laughs> um, you know, I get in trouble sometimes, especially when I'm talking to funders and founders. I say, hey, look, we're going to make mistakes. It's not going to be perfect. Um, and we're, we're going to make those mistakes. We're going to run through those walls and we're going to learn from them. Um, I think we have this illusion that the the traditional method is, uh, you know, they make no mistakes. The, the person they ended up selling them all to had gone bankrupt so many times. It's not even funny. Um, uh, let's not even get started on Elon Musk, right? <laughs> I don't know how you convince that many people to buy Twitter for $44 billion, how many problems he's got. And so, you know, it does not have to be perfect. Sometimes it just takes in a building, people coming together saying, hey, can we can we come together to buy the property? What does that look like? Those are the seeds of the conversation. And then talking to those who are in the community development corporation world or or at the city, and then looking at the, the clips that, that are on uh, Boss New GMS YouTube channel. Every Wednesday, we do the same thing. We've got our, our community education pieces, where we, which is both an organizing opportunity and also an ability for select leaders, those who are committing to come to a regular meeting, come to a regular meeting, learn more about the solidarity economy because we all have something to learn from one another. Um, but you know, I also just say that you know there is a tremendous need for creating these resources. And yeah, I'm laughing because I'm the exact same way. I've declared email bankruptcy on one of mine, and the other, I wish I could get to get to them. There's just there are good people doing great work, but we need more disciples. We need more people who are singing the gospel of the solidarity economy and cooperative space. And I think the only reason there aren't more is because, frankly, it's not as well resourced. I will get I will get on my uh, on my on my uh, Instagram all types of ads about teaching me how to fix and flip because I'm always looking for real estate. Right? All of these ads about how to become a, a realtor and cash in. You know, the, those same resources that are directed toward them could be directed toward others, other efforts that are more collectively uh, identified, collectively driven, mission driven. But uh, we don't necessarily see that same level of support. Um, definitely not from the private sector, but definitely not even from philanthropy. They'd rather they'd rather fund the organizing or the resource, but not necessarily the, the creation of the many disciples that are necessary for us to execute the programs. And so I think it's it's a it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. But all of us are over overworked and we've just got to find time like you have done, uh, Professor Sutton, and how the S Band Network has done to come together to learn from one another and take every moment that we can um, to engage in community and build together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I think just to emphasize that the importance of really normalizing the collective, right, um, as opposed to the individual focus that we have culturally. Um, uh, Brett, I see your hand shaking, and then I'll, I'll turn to um, Final two, comments. Yeah, two quick things. One, I did a recent study of uh, employee ownership, New York City, a municipal led effort to build employee ownership firms. And I'll just say it's tough, right? Like it takes a long time because you got to hit that firm. And these are operating businesses, different from some of the real estate things we've been talking about. But um, you got to hit that firm at the point somebody's retiring or ready to sell. You got to mobilize. You got to have the infusion of capital to do the purchase. Like it is hard work and it can be done but it really does take that building of a whole new infrastructure to help it push it forward. So I think the role of the public sector is key. I just, we need long-term commitments because we need these groups that have and can develop the skilled expertise uh, to build capacity, to engage with businesses, owners, to engage with employees on the real estate, to source deals um, over the long term. And the same in the financial institutions. And by that, I mean, in particular, the mission, the CDFIs and others. Um, so that's on the municipal role. On, on the promising features side, I guess I would just say, you know, we've been documenting some of this learning. You've heard the incredible expertise that, that is getting um, sharpened as people make their way through these projects. I'll just say that uh, my one encouragement is 
to think hard about what the most important things to accomplish are, because any given project is not going to be able to do everything. And if we load too, too much expectation on any single project, we're not going to get what out of it that we most want. And so, like, for example, if we're trying to create wealth, we need to have profitable projects, right? We need to have projects that actually generate financial return. But but what if, and we need to grapple with these tensions, like what if that means we have a dollar store instead of a full service grocery store? Do we live with that trade off or do we not? Do we say actually it's more important that we get the type of retail in this place that is most important for us? Um, so uh, I guess just a, a kind of real world, you know, it needs to be profitable. It needs to be financially secure. It clearly needs to be community engaged and community benefiting. People have different um, uh, opinions about what that is, um, but there needs to be small ways that people can buy in over time. They need to be able to exit easily. Uh, and so there's just a lot that goes into making this work in the real world that is what's some of what's so engaging and important and dynamic about it. Absolutely. Thank you. In 20 um, seconds. Yeah, 20, thank you. <laughs> In 20, because they're, they're going to cut <laughs> off our microphones. Uh, I'll just say thank you. Uh, and I do whatever Nia tells me to do. So, um, but also, you know, what I will just say very quickly is this is why it's also important, like who we have on the government side, um, not just elected positions, but who they're appointing to these positions. You know, my grandfather did a lot of work on the civil rights movement here in Massachusetts with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but we're still talking about stuff he was fighting for 50 years ago. And so those are the things that inform not just what I'm doing, but the work that we're doing here at the city. My my director of policy, his PhD is in the solidarity economy because I'm no expert, but he is. Um, and so everything we do is channeled through uh, Elijah um, uh, to make sure that we are actually um, not repeating the same mistakes um, of the past. Thank you for keeping it 20 seconds. Absolutely. It's training, building our capacity, um, gonna, where we are. We build the capacity for, I try to do that with my students, build the capacity so that they go work in public sector and, and have a, an understanding of solidarity economy, economic democracy, cooperative economics. But with that, first, I'm humbly thank each of you for responding to my email. I'm like, I'm so honored that you responded to my email. Um, and for being here, and I'm surely going to follow up with you. And we are one minute over, so uh, I apologize for, for that. But thank you each. Thank you all. Thanks to you, Stacey. Thank you. Thank you.